God is good. All the time. time. Welcome to worship. And we welcome to those that are joining us via Facebook and and YouTube this morning as well. And uh, my goodness, we are starting off on the 75th year of this congregation. Isn't that amazing? So... Yeah, we say, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness among us. And with that, as, as part of the, that, as, uh, um, there are yard signs out there. Uh, and when you leave here, we want you to take one home and plant it in your yard. Uh, just as, a, as a, a, a little celebration of, you know, thank you, Lord, for uh, all these amazing years. So, uh, so as we begin... Uh, we also have a special guest this morning, uh, Pastor Mark Vanderteig. Uh, he has been the LCMC, uh, uh, what is it, area coordinator, service coordinator. There we go. Uh, and uh, we've had the pleasure of having him here a couple of other times before, and it's great to, to give you the pulpit this morning and give us the word. So with that, would you please rise as we begin The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You are the treasured people of the Lord, a people holy to the Lord our God. Keep the words of the Lord in your heart. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. One does not live by bread alone. Every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Clothe us with humility. Give us a hunger for grace. Thank you for your promise to give grace to the humble. Amen. Now living together in trust and hope, let us confess our faith in the words of Luther's explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and will give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. You may be seated.
The first reading is from Daniel chapter 4, verses 19 and verses 24 through 27. Then Daniel, who was called Daniel, who was called Belthazar, was severely distressed for a while. His thoughts terrified him. The king said, Belthazar, do not let the dream or the interpretation terrify you. Belthazar answered, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew great and strong, so that its top reached to heaven and was visible to the whole end of the whole earth, whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and which provided food for all, under which animals of the field lived, and who, in whose branches the birds of the air had nests. It is you, O king. You have grown great and strong. Your greatness has increased and reaches to heaven, and your sovereignty to the ends of the earth. And whereas the king saw a holy watcher coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the ground, with a band of iron and bronze in the grass of the field, and let him be bathed with the dew of heaven, and let his lot be with the animals of the field, until seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and it is a decree of the Most High that has come upon my lord the king. You shall be driven away from human society, and your dwelling shall be with the wild animals. You shall be made to eat grass like oxen. You shall be bathed with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, until you have learned that the Most High has sovereignty over the kingdom of mortals, and gives it to whom he will. And it was commanded to leave the stump and roots of the tree. Your kingdom shall be reestablished for you from the time that you learn that heaven is sovereign. Therefore, O king, May my counsel be acceptable to you. Atone for your sins with righteousness and your iniquities with mercy to the oppressed so that your prosperity may be prolonged. The responsive reading is from Psalm chapter 119, verses 65 through 68. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me your judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was humbled, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. <laughs> Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for this prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the reading. Please rise for the gospel. Our gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18. And at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child, whom he put among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. This is the gospel of the Lord. And then, if you would join with me as we, as we just read all of these words that, that are up on the top. So, so let us begin. It's, it's during our, well, with Max Lucado and the Unshakable Hope book that we're reading. And so join with me. We are building our lives on the promises of God. Because his word is unbreakable, our hope is unshakable. We do not stand on the problems of life or the pain in life. We stand on the great and precious promises of God. And now I invite our guest preacher today. You may be seated. Mark Vandertyke. Is it all right if I stay down here? Yes. Okay. All 
Now I think it comes on, right? Amazing technology. What an interesting time we are in. Oh, I have to set my timer. Just a minute. Uh, there we go. 70% of my job is to travel. And of the remaining 30%, probably at least 20% is related to planning for or getting home from travel. And so uh, this is my first trip since March 15th. And uh, so people said, oh, we're glad to have you here. I said, I'm glad to be anywhere except my house, you know, in my town. I mean, I've, I've been around the world and, and uh, all over the U.S. and North America. And, and so it's really great just to be on the road again. So thank you for inviting me. And thank you for letting me come and be a part of this. I love this idea of wearing masks. You have a Menards here in town? Oh, we got a Menards in my town, and you have to wear a mask when you walk in. So I wear a bandana, and when I talk to the security guard, I say, uh, next I'm going to go rob a bank. You want to come with me? And, you know, because it looked like the Old West, you wear that bandana thing. It is a very interesting time, and sometimes we get a little overwhelmed that this is a time like no other. This is my fourth pandemic. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, but... Uh, uh, you remember the 60s? Remember the 60s? We had two assassinations. We had rioting in the streets. All the major cities were in upheaval. Uh, there was uh, rioting outside political conventions. Uh, I mean, we had Woodstock. And in 1967, I think, the birth control pill was uh, released. I mean, I'm telling you what, turmoil and upheaval is probably normal. Uh, we've enjoyed a time of relative calm in our culture, but we're not in that moment right now. Can you think over the last 75 years, do you think the last 75 years were pretty peaceful? Do you know that 1945, 75 years ago, we celebrated the end of World War II? You think the culture and the world was in little upheaval? Absolutely. This is not new. This is kind of the regular human experience. Sooner or later, things get shaken up. And what's interesting to me is that churches have uh, begun to recognize there's a thing in the world called the Internet. And many of our congregations, like Gloria Day, have begun using it in a way that we never used it before. I mean, you might have had it, right? And you had some other things going on with it. But you did it kind of because it was kind of a thing to do. But now we recognize it is the thing to do. And it has tremendous potential for the sake of the kingdom. There are some congregations who are, who are expanding and exploding their reach because now they are taking what happens in here and putting it on the Internet so people can participate. Now, that doesn't mean that we ought to step away from gathering together. In 1 Thessalonians, it said, don't any of you forget to get together as some are already in the habit of doing. So there were people in the first century who stopped getting together. So this is not new either, but, but this idea of being able to broadcast this, to be able to put this into homes is really remarkable. I was talking to a Roman Catholic woman some time ago, maybe a month ago, and I said, so what are you all doing about uh, the Mass? Because, you know, for the Roman Church, that's kind of central. And she said, you know, it's so amazing. I can watch that any time now. It's so convenient to go to church. And I said, yeah, Jesus said a lot of stuff about convenience. It's good that we can broadcast this and put this out there. Not a problem. But when we think about our reach in the kingdom, we need to use every tool that's available to us. And certainly live streaming is one of us. I've never really been a student of history. I never really thought much about it. I'm kind of one of those guys that's always looking forward. So I picked this text out of Philippians where Paul says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is coming. You know, that's been kind of my life. Uh, I had a rear view mirror drop off of my pickup once. You ever had that happen? You know, it just drops off, the glue quits. I didn't put it back on because I hardly ever looked back. I drove an old Volkswagen Camback years ago, and I, and, and I only had it for one year. I was going to have it from August until July. In December, I lost reverse. 
I mean, the gear just went away. But if you think about it, you never really have to back up. You've got to kind of think about where you're parking. I'm the kind of guy that's always looking forward, looking to the next thing. But history can teach us some remarkable truths. Do you know, for example, that really people didn't mark time for a long time in the history of the human race? Uh, but the Israelites, when they thought about their relationship with God, they would kind of begin to mark time. And so they would say, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they looked back and they remembered what had happened. And remembering what had happened taught them how to live today. There are lessons that we can learn from our history. And if we don't learn those lessons, we are bound to repeat them. You may have heard somebody say that. It's fascinating for us when we think about what has been. For example, what has been the history of Gloria Day? Uh, do you have a book that kind of marks that timeline? Do you have some record of the life of this congregation over the course of the last 75 years? In LCMC, we're facing a transition. I've announced my retirement, and so I'm done with this job in, I don't know, 82 days, but who's counting? I am. And so in 82 days, I am done with this job, which, and it's been a great privilege and a tremendous opportunity, and I have not regretted, well, there have been a couple of days I wasn't happy about, but for the most part, this has been a tremendous gift to me. But now I'm worried about the next generation of leadership, right? Uh, I'm one of the original participants. I'm a charter member, so to speak. Are there any charter members here today of Gloria Day? Are you? Excellent. Excellent. See, that's interesting. Charter members, you know, we come together for a certain cause and we remember what it was and we were excited about it. Sometimes we think about those days. And, and so we wrote a book 10 years ago because we're 20 years old. The first 10 years of LCMC, the first 10 years. My concern now is, is the next generation going to remember what we were hoping to do? See, I believe that we are and were we came together as a theological and ecclesiological movement. Didn't want to form a denomination. Didn't want to put together an institution. We didn't want to be shackled by all of that structure and bureaucracy. And I'm worried that maybe we're going to miss that and start to pay more attention to LCMC than to you. Because, see, I think that in LCMC, you're the most important thing we got going. It's the local church. It's where everything happens. It's the local church where people come to bring their babies to be baptized, to bring their families to come to worship, to raise their children in Sunday school and confirmation. It's where we come to join together in marriage. It's where we kind of work together through the issues of life. And then finally, this is where we gather to say goodbye to people that we have loved and who have loved us. That didn't happen in my office. I got nine square feet in the basement of my house. That's it. <laughs> so the congregation is the front line. It is the most important thing. It's where ministry and mission are carried out. I want us to remember how we started. I want us to remember those core values and principles. I want us to remember what we consider to be essential and fundamental to this movement. Because if we don't, we're going to become just like every other church body and eventually die. We actually had a consultant come and talk to us at one point, and they said, you know what, you can keep doing the same thing, and in 20 years, you'll be gone. Do you suppose Gloria Day is exactly the way it was 75 years ago as it is today? Probably not. Lots of the things around us have changed. For example, 75 years ago, there wasn't an Internet. There wasn't cell phones. There wasn't any of the stuff that we consider to be normal. There wasn't even a TV for the most part. My dad uh, was uh, the owner of Clearview Television. And uh, when the TVs first started coming out, you know, they were in great big boxes and a little tiny screen. And then color TV hit in the 60s, and it was like, wow. And now we take all that for granted and a million other things. But there are some core values, some principles, some, some fundamental things upon which we stand that will never change. Jesus, the same today, yesterday, and forever. The word of God shall not perish, but return to accomplish the purpose for what it was given. Uh, God's word remains the same. The things around us can change absolutely. 
Those fundamental principles are important for us. There's a thing that happened about 500 years ago that was a remarkable challenge in terms of the culture. And it really began to create hope for a thing called the Reformation. Anybody know what it was? Printing press. It was brand new technology. They'd never seen anything like it before. And so what these reformers would write down could be duplicated and mass produced in a way that they'd never seen before. The folks then took advantage of what was happening in service of the kingdom. And we can do the same thing right now. We can take advantage of this technology to expand and develop the kingdom. We want to hang on to those core values, principles, what we consider to be essential. <clears throat> Sometimes people are a little worried, well, it's not so popular today. You know, to stand up for the cause of Christ, to say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only name under heaven by which one can be saved. Some people are saying, you know what, that's not really very popular, and that might offend somebody. And if we, and if we do that, we don't want to make trouble and so we kind of have the impression that we have to kind of be quiet now. That we can't stand up for what we know to be true. Do you know that every major mainline Protestant denomination in the U.S. that has adopted the cultural standards is dying? It's failing. Sometimes people think, well, you know, this Jesus, he's... Wasn't he supposed to be nice always? And isn't it always all about love in this hyper grace kind of moment in which we live? I don't know if you've read the New Testament, but Jesus had some pretty strong words for people, all kinds of people. And, and we shouldn't be surprised about that. Jesus has been countercultural in every generation, in every location. He's been countercultural. And yet the churches today that are growing have two things in common. Number one, a clear proclamation of the name of Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And number two, an outward mentality. They're looking at the world and asking, how can we serve it? And, and so when congregations want to think about how we interact in this culture, in this time and place, we need not to back away from the name of Jesus. What we need to do is recognize that it's not so much about public proclamations, but it's about you and me recognizing that you and I are ambassadors in a culture that is tired of big proclamations. It's about person to person. It's about next door neighbor. It's about looking for opportunities to help. One of the things that's become important in my life lately is uh, an opportunity to pray with people. Have you ever done that? Just prayed with somebody out loud, a kind of a spontaneous prayer. Ever done that? It is kind of one of the coolest things that ever happened to me. Uh, I heard this at a conference I attended, and a guy said, you cannot imagine the power there is in praying with people. He just can't imagine it. And so kind of my practice now when I'm sitting in a restaurant, because are the restaurants open here? Are they? Okay, so they are in Iowa too. And they've been open for a little while now. And it's just kind of fun. You sit down and the wait person brings your food. And then when they do that, they say, now, is there anything else I can get you? You know, isn't that pretty common? I always say, well, you know, uh, no, I think we're fine. But we're going to pray for our meal. Would it be all right if we prayed for you? Is there something in your life we could pray for? And it's remarkable how people respond. I mean, it'll blow your mind if you give it a shot. Uh, this one gal, we were at an Outback Steakhouse. You got those up here? So we were in Outback, and, and uh, we had some friends visiting us from our hometown, high school classmates. And uh, I said that, and they kind of looked at me like they'd never heard that before. And uh, I said to the wait staff, this woman, I said, is there anything about your life for which we could pray? She goes, well, yeah, my little boy is sick, and I'm really worried about him. Would you pray for him? I said, sure, what's his name? And he said, well, it's, you know, Donnie or whatever. So I said, yeah, we'll pray for Donnie. And so when we, she left and we took our time for prayer and we prayed for Donnie. And, and, and it was kind of quiet in the restaurant that night. She came back and she said, you know, no one's, ever, no one's ever prayed for me before. And we said, well, you know, I believe that prayer matters. It makes a difference. It changes things. And she goes, well, would you also pray for my marriage? And then she started to get a little teared up. 
I mean, it was quiet in the restaurant right then. She actually pulled up a chair, and we started chatting about her relationship with her husband. It was the coolest moment ever. Our classmates from high school never seen anything like that. <laughs> they were kind of thinking, what happened to Mark and Candace? But uh, it was just the coolest moment. I'm in Salisbury, North Carolina, and I uh, just got on my blue jeans and my high-top tennis shoes and a T-shirt, got my backpack on and my duffel bag, walking in the hotel. Guy pulls up in a little old car and uh, rolled down a passenger side window, and this woman says, excuse me, sir, could you help us? I said, well, what do you need? And uh, he leans over and he said, I have a job interview in Charlotte, but we need some gas money. Could you help? And I said, I will give you all the money I have in my pocket. See, I get an allowance, I get $34 every pay period, twice a month I get 34 bucks. My wife is our CFO and she is tougher than nails. So I never have a whole lot of money on me, ever. So I reached in my pocket, I had $12. I said, I get 12 bucks and that's all I got. And he said, well, that would be great. I said, but before you go, could I pray for you and for this job interview? And he said, well, sure. So I took her hand and I said, why don't you grab his hand? And so we held hands, and I prayed for them. And uh, they, were, they were just stunned. They were speechless. And uh, I, I thought, well, you know, if they're actually just going to go buy beer, I know that Jesus is going with them. <laughs> Can't beat that, right? I mean, it's a moment when you pray with somebody, and it's a simple thing to do. You don't have to have fancy language. You don't have to be super smart. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to have a theological degree. Just talk to God with these other folks. Because when you pray with them, it communicates so much. Number one, there is a God in the world whose name is Jesus, who cares about them enough to put somebody in their life to pray for them. You, you can't imagine what a powerful impact that has. See, I think what we're experiencing today is unlike what we've maybe thought about over the last 50 years. I, when I was a kid going to church, it, it was all about the pastor up front and the big building and the pipe organ. That what, that's what it was to go to church. And everybody flocked into that church because that one of the first things people did 50 years ago when they moved to Toma, they started looking for a church. You, you knew that, right? Are they doing that today? People are not. There's some research in the culture that says over 60% of your town has already decided they're not coming in your building. They want nothing to do with it. They don't even know what goes on inside here. It scares them. I don't know what they think goes on, but if they can live stream it, catch it, they can see that we're pretty normal people. We're not sacrificing animals on the altar. There's no blood running down that thing right now. My daughter brought home a man... Christmas Eve, we, we didn't know him and never met him before, but she thought this would be a good time to introduce him, and, and my wife had had the table set for like two weeks, and when Laura said, we're bringing another guest, I thought, well, we're going to have to call out the National Guard to get another plate on the table. Is there going to be enough food? You know, my wife's a planner. Uh, amen. My timer just went off. I'll, I'll finish this. And then I'll quit. So he walks in the door. I greet him. We're just chatting a little bit, getting to know him. And I said, uh, you know, you're coming to Christmas Eve service with us tonight. And he goes, yeah, Laura said I had to. You go, girl. It's my daughter. I said, well, you've probably been to a Christmas Eve service before. And he said, no, not really. Who has never been to a Christmas Eve service? Somebody that's never been to church. So when we had girls, the moment we knew it was a girl, we started praying for the man someday they would marry. And my wife was looking at me, this cannot possibly be the man we've been praying for for 30 years. But it turned out it was. And so I said to him, tell you what, I'll, I'll stand by you so you kind of, you know, don't get lost in the process of the service. He said, that'd be great because I don't know what you people do in there. Just think about that. I don't know what you people do in there. What are we going to do about that? We're surrounded by people in our culture that don't know Jesus, not connected to a local church. 
Inviting them to church is not going to be the best plan. It's not going to be the most effective method. The most effective thing that we can do to help people into a relationship with Jesus is connect with them. Open the conversation. Be patient. We don't have to get it done by Tuesday. The Holy Spirit is still at work in the hearts and minds of all the folks in this community. And maybe they're waiting for that moment when a relationship forms that you can actually talk about your faith. The question then is, do you have anything to say? I have grandchildren now. I am that old. I have grandchildren, and it's just fun to be able to lean into these little lives with the name of Jesus. It is so cool. I took my little grandson to McDonald's for chicken nuggets because I'm all about health food. (laughs) And uh, we sit down with our food, and I said, Joel, shall we pray over this? He said, no, I don't like to pray. Well, his dad's a pastor, so I don't know what happened there. And uh, maybe your dad goes on too long, I don't know. And I said, uh, well, can we just talk to Jesus then? Oh, yeah, we could do that. He didn't like the word prayer, but he's okay with talking to Jesus. And so I said, okay, so let's do that. And I said, dear Jesus, you know, thank you for this day and for this food. I thank you for my little grandson, for his mom and dad and his sister, and just ask your blessing on the people that work here. In Jesus' name, amen. He said, amen, real loud, so everybody could hear. See, sometimes I think the language we use is maybe not like what we normally do or say or talk about. You know, if you go into Walmart and you say, the Lord be with you, what do you expect them to say back? They'd say, what's wrong with you? See, sometimes the church language we use or the way that we talk in church is not the way we talk normally. And I just want you to know, if we're going to be ambassadors for Jesus in our daily life, we don't have to be churchy. We can just be who we are. Flaws, brokenness, sin and all. People want us to be real. They just want us to be real. And if you'll be open to that, if you'll start thinking about that, praying with somebody, having a conversation, just being available, looking for opportunities to serve so that eventually they might ask, if you'll be available, God will put people in your path and they will ask you, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? This is not 1945. It's 2020. The culture has changed. Everything around us is different. But these fundamentals, these essentials, these principles, founding principles upon which we are built, they never change. And I guarantee you, friends, if you'll be interested, willing, and open to this possibility of taking this faith out of these doors and into your daily life, great things can happen. I want to thank you for 75 years of faithful ministry. I want to thank you and commend you for stepping into 2020, for finding a way to live stream and broadcast and and save all this stuff and get it out on the internet. I want to thank you and commend you for your willingness to adopt and to adapt to this century, to this decade, to this moment. Because if we're going to survive and be a part of what God's already doing, we got to be asking, Lord, lead us into this day. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here today, and uh, I appreciate a chance just to be anywhere right now. So uh, I'm ecstatic to be out of my town. God bless you, friends, and may you have another great 75 years, more than you ever imagined. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Please stand if you are able as we continue in the time of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we we come before your throne of grace and mercy to ask that, that you bring humility into our lives, that you allow us to not be filled with pride or jealousy or boastful gestures toward those around us, But let our hearts be filled with your love, with your joy and peace and happiness. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for for the 75 years that we 
have been a part of this ministry through Gloria Day. Thank you, Lord, for the strength that you have given us, and, and we pray that, that we continue for another 75 years with spreading the good word of Jesus and his love. Yes, Lord, it is keeping those, those roots together. Even though things change around us, you never change. You continue to be solid and, and whole with, with the faith that you just pour down upon us. And Lord, we thank you for, for ministers like Pastor Mark who are able to, to come out and share that message. The message of hope, the message of, of truth. And though technology changes and we are able to, to reach out to people in different ways, well, that's the way it's always been. We just need to use those things that you have given us to reach out in your mission. So, Lord Jesus, continue to teach us to be kind and gentle and generous and forgiving. To cast out every evil that allows pride to, to get the better of us. Mold us into better people as you walk beside us through life's journey. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, we lift to you this nation. A nation with, with all its divisions, all its unrest, but... But again, today we ask that you help each one of us to walk humbly with our brothers and sisters. It's all too easy for us to fall prey to, to the flesh, to this world, to walk in arrogance, knowing that pride often causes division, but we desire peace. Help us to count ourselves as equals with one another and to be guided by you, our Lord and Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you care tenderly for all who suffer among us. And there are many who are suffering with this COVID-19 and with cancers and, and other issues in their lives. But we particularly pray for, for those who, who are close to us. We pray for Larry Adams and Kathy Steinmetz, Carolee Lindenberg, Sherry Lamb, Bill Brown, Eileen Kirsten, and Sue Johnson, for Bob Conant and Marlene Schultz and Zoe Bolden. And we also join with family and friends as they pray for Roger and Phil. Anita, Emery, Emmett, Shelley, and Alyssa, and for all those whom we name in our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, as we celebrate this 75 years, there, there are other celebrations that are going on. And celebrations of, of anniversaries and, and, of course, birthdays. And we, we say happy birthday to Luann this day. Lord, being, being cooped up in quarantine and, and all of these different frustrations for people, it's, it's hard to celebrate. But Lord, we know that you are there with us each and every moment of our lives. And that is a celebration that we need to celebrate every day. Lord, keep those who are traveling during this time of COVID safe. Let us be thankful for the freedoms that 
each one of us have. Let us remember the men and women who have been called into the armed forces, who maintain the union of this nation. We pray for our police officers, our firefighters, our emergency people, our doctors and nurses, for all who help in the healthcare system. And Lord, we pray especially for our men and women who, who defend the freedoms in this nation. And we especially pray namely for Alex Holly and Travis Turner and Tia Hughes and for all those men and women who bravely sacrifice their lives for us. Heavenly Father, it is important to be humble in you. It sets things to a proper order and perspective. The enemy of this world would have us thrown into things like arrogance and pride, things that slant the lens in which we see the world and how we see others. Help us to love one another as you have loved us to reach out in the mission that you have put in front of us. As we celebrate the 75 years in your mission here at Gloria Day, we give thanks to you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we prepared in this mess, there again, 75 years, and we are launching into a bold new future, whatever that might be, all to the glory of God, which is what our name stands for, uh, the gl Gloria Day. And that last song was very appropriate because you know what 
uh, bonded people together to form Gloria Day was the concern for the raising of our kids and for families. And uh, that is at our very core. And may, that, may, may the Lord enliven that in us as we march forward, uh, leaving what lies behind and pressing on towards the goal that is held in Christ Jesus. So with that, may you all go in peace, serve the Lord.